This is Grandma reading to her grandkids The Christmas Miracle of Jonathan Toomey by Susan Wojciechowski. I'm not quite sure if I pronounced that correctly. Oh, there's a little village with a church, mountains. Right, these pages are difficult to turn. Oh. The village children called him Mr. Gloomy, but in fact his name was Toomey, Mr. Jonathan Toomey. And though it's not kind to call people names, this one fit quite well. For Jonathan Toomey seldom smiled, never laughed. He went about mumbling and grumbling, muttering and sputtering, grumping and griping. He complained that the church bells rang too often, the birds sang too shrilly, and the children played too loudly. Mr. Toomey was a woodcarver. Some said he was the best woodcarver in the whole valley. He spent his days sitting in a workbench carving beautiful shapes from blocks of pine and hickory and chestnut wood. After supper, he sat in a straight back chair near the fireplace, smoking his pipe and staring into the flames. Jonathan Toomey wasn't an old man, but if you saw him, you might think he was, the way he walked bent forward with his head down. You wouldn't notice his eyes, the clear blue of an August sky, and you wouldn't see the dimple on his chin since his face was mostly hidden under a shaggy, untrimmed beard, speckled with sawdust and wood shavings, and depending what he ate that day, with crumbs of bread and a bit of potato or dried gravy. So he's making an owl, and then here's another little carving over here. The village people didn't know it, but there was a reason for his gloom, for his grumbling, a reason why he walked hunched over, as if carrying a great weight on his shoulders. Some years earlier, when Jonathan Toomey was full, young and full of life and full of love, his wife and baby had become very sick. And because those were the days before hospitals and medicines and skilled doctors, his wife and baby died three days apart from each other. So Jonathan Toomey had packed his belongings into a wagon and traveled till his tears stopped. He settled into the tiny house at the edge of the village to do his wood carving. One day in early December, there was a knock at Jonathan's door. Mumbling and grumbling, he went to answer it, and there stood a woman and a young boy. I'm the widow McDowell, new in your village. This is my son, Thomas. I'm seven, and I know how to whistle, said Thomas. Whistling is pish posh, said the woodcarver gruffly. I need something carved, said the woman. And she told Jonathan about a very special set of Christmas figures her grandfather had carved for her when she was a girl. After I moved here, I discovered they were lost, she explained. I'd hoped that by some miracle I would find them again, but it hasn't happened. There are no such things as miracles, a woodcarver told her. Now, could you describe the figures for me? There were sheep, she told him. Two of them with curly wool, added Thomas. Yes, two, said the widow, and a cow and an angel, Mary, Joseph, baby Jesus, and the wise men. Three of them, added Thomas. Will you take the job, asked the widow McDowell. I will. I'm grateful. How soon can you have them ready? They will be ready when they are ready, he said. But I must have them by Christmas. They mean so much to me. I can't remember a Christmas without them. Christmas is pish posh, said Jonathan gruffly, and he shut the door. The following week, there was a knock at the woodcarver's door. Muttering and sputtering, he went to answer it, and there stood the widow McDowell and Thomas. Excuse me, said the widow, but Thomas has been begging to come and watch you work. He says he wants to be a woodcarver when he grows up, and he would like to watch you, since you are the best in the valley. I'll be quiet. You won't even know I'm here. Please, please, piped in Thomas. With a grumble, the woodcarver stepped aside to let them in. He pointed to a stool near his workbench. No talking, no jiggling, no noise, he ordered Thomas. The widow McDowell handed Mr. Toomey a warm loaf of cornbread as a token of thanks. Then she took out her knitting and sat down in a rocking chair in front of the far corner of the cottage. Not there, bellowed the woodcarver. No one sits in that chair. So she moved to a high back chair by the fireplace. Thomas sat very still. Once, when he needed to sneeze, he pressed a finger under his nose to hold it back. Once, when he wanted desperately to scratch his leg, he counted to 20 to keep his mind off the itch. After a very long time, 
Thomas cleared his throat and whispered, Mr. Toomey, may I ask a question? The woodcarver glared at Thomas, then shrugged his shoulders and grunted. Thomas decided it meant yes, so he went on. Is that my sheep you're carving? The woodcarver nodded and grunted again. After another very long time, Thomas whispered, Mr. Toomey, excuse me, but you're carving my sheep wrong. The widow McDowell's knitting needles stopped clicking. Jonathan Toomey's knife stopped carving. Thomas went on. It's a beautiful sheep. Nice and curly, but my sheep looked happy. That's pish posh, said Mr. Toomey. Sheep are sheep. They cannot look happy. Mine did, said Thomas. They knew they were with the baby Jesus, so they were happy. After that, Thomas was quiet for the rest of the afternoon. When the church bells chimed six o'clock, Mr. Toomey grumbled under his breath about the awful noise. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas sneezed three times, then thanked the woodcarver for allowing him to watch. That evening, after supper of cornbread and boiled potatoes, the woodcarver sat down at his bench. He picked up his knife, he picked up the sheep, and he worked till his eyelids drooped. And there we have two sheep. A few days later, there was a knock at the woodcarver's door. Griping and grumbling, he went to answer it, and there stood the widow and her son. May I watch again? I'll be quiet, Thomas said. He settled himself on the stool very quietly while his mother laid a basket of sweet-smelling buns on the table. The teapot is warm, Mr. Toomey said gruffly, his head bent over his work. While Mr. Toomey carved, the widow McDowell poured tea. She touched the woodcarver gently on the shoulder and placed a cup of tea and a bun next to him. He pretended not to notice, but soon both the plate and the cup were empty. Thomas tried to eat the bun his mother had given him as quietly as he could, but it was almost impossible by seven to be seven and eat a warm, sticky bun without making various smacking, licking, and satisfying noises. When Thomas had finished, he tried to sit quietly. Once, he almost hiccuped, but he took a deep breath and held it until his face turned red, and once more, without thinking, he began to swing his legs. But a glare from the woodcarver stopped him and kept and so he kept them them still until he, they fell asleep after a very long time thomas whispered mr toomey excuse me may i ask a question grunt is that my cow you're carving nod and grunt another very long time went by then thomas cleared his throat and said mr toomey excuse me but i must tell you something that is a beautiful cow the most beautiful cow I've ever seen, but it's not right. My cow looked proud. That's pish posh, growled the woodcarver. Cows are cows, they cannot look proud. My cow did. It knew that Jesus chose to be born in his barn. It was proud. Thomas was quiet for the rest of the afternoon. The only sounds that could be heard were the scraping of the carving knife, the humming of the widow McDowell, and the click click of her knitting needles. When the church bells chimed six o'clock, Mr. Toomey muttered under his breath about the noise. Widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas shook first one leg, then the other. He thanked the woodcarver for allowing him to watch. That evening, after supper of boiled potatoes and raisin buns, the woodcarver sat down at the bench. He picked up his carving knife, he picked up the cow, and he worked until his eyelids drooped shut. And there's the cow. A few days later, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door. He smoothed down his hair as he went to answer it. At the door, were the widow and her son. May I watch again? Asked Thomas. Mrs. McDowell warmed the tea and put a plate of fresh molasses cookies on the workbench. Thomas watched the woodcarver work on the figure of the angel. After a long time, Thomas spoke. Ah, Mr. Toomey, excuse me. Is that my angel you're carving? Yes, and would you do me the favor of telling me exactly what I'm doing wrong? Well, my angel looked like one of God's most important angels because it was sent to baby Jesus. And just how does one make an angel look important? Asked the woodcarver. You'll be able to do it, said Thomas. You are best woodcarver in the valley. After another very long time, Thomas spoke. Mr. Toomey, excuse me, may I ask a question? Do you ever stop talking? Asked the woodcarver. My mother says I don't. She says I could learn about the virtue of silence from you. Under his breath, the woodcarver's face turned pink. The widow McDowell's face turned red as the scarf she was knitting. Well, speak up. What is your question? Will you please teach me to carve? I'm a very busy man, grumbled the woodcarver, but he put down the important angel. You will carve a bird. A robin, I hope, said Miss Thomas. I like robins.
With a piece of charcoal, the woodcarver sketched a robin on a piece of brown paper. He handed Thomas a small block of pine and a knife. He showed him how to lop the corners from the block and slowly smooth the edges of the wood into curves. Thomas copied the woodcarver strokes, head bent, tongue working from side to side of his lower lip as he concentrated. When the church bells chimed at six o'clock, Jonathan Timmy was holding Thomas's hand in his, guiding the knife along the edge of the wing. He didn't hear them ringing. The widow McDowell said it was time to leave. Thomas brushed wood shavings from his shirt, and then he reached out and brushed two especially large pieces of wood shavings from Jonathan Toomey's beard. He thanked the woodcarver for teaching him how to carve. Later, after a supper of boiled potatoes and molasses cookies, Jonathan Toomey went to his workbench. He thought for a long time. He sketched drawing after drawing. Finally, he picked up his carving knife. He picked up the angel, and he carved until his eyelids drooped shut. And there's the angel. A few days later, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door. Mr. Toomey jumped up to answer it. There stood the wooden McDowell with a bouquet of pine boughs and holly sprigs dotted with berries. And there stood Thomas clutching the partly carved robin. While Thomas and Mr. Toomey carved, Mrs. McDowell put the branches in a jar of water. She scrubbed Mr. Toomey's kitchen table, set the jar in the center on a pretty cloth embroidered with lilies of the valley and daisies which she found in a drawer below the cupboard. Next, I will carve the wise men and Joseph, the woodcarver said to Thomas. Perhaps, before I begin, you will tell me about all the mistakes I'm going to make. Well, said Thomas, my wise men were wearing their most wonderful robes because they were going to visit Jesus. My Joseph was leaning over baby Jesus like he was protecting him. He looked very serious. It wasn't until the church bells chimed that Mr. Toomey saw the jar of pine branches and the cloth embroidered with lilies of the valley and daisies. I found the cloth in a drawer. I thought it would look pretty on the table, the widow McDowell said, smiling. Never open that drawer, the woodcarver said harshly. When the two had left, Jonathan folded the cloth and put it back in the drawer below the cupboard. That evening, after a sup of boiled potatoes, and the woodcarver went on, worked on Joseph and the wise men until his eyelids drooped shut. And there we have them. A few days later, there was a knock on the woodcarver's door. He dusted the crumbs from his head, his beard, and brushed the sawdust from his shirt out of the door with the widow McDowell and Thomas. All afternoon, Thomas watched the woodcarver work. When it was time to leave, Jonathan said to Thomas, I am about to begin the last two figures, Mary and the baby. Can you tell me how your figures looked? They were the most special of all. Jesus was smiling and reaching up to his mother. Mary looked like she loved him very much. Thank you, Thomas, said the woodcarver. Tomorrow is Christmas. Is there any chance the figures will be ready, the widow McDowell asked. They will be ready when they will be ready. I understand, said the widow, and she handed Jonathan two packages. Merry Christmas, she said. Jonathan folded his arms across his chest. I want no presents, he said harshly. See, here's the presents right there. That is exactly why we are giving them to you, answered the widow. She put them on the table and left. Jonathan sat down at the table, so he opened the first package. Inside was a red scarf, hand-knit, warm and bright. He tied the scarf around his neck. The other parcel held a robin, crudely carved of pine. A smile twitched at the corners of Jonathan's mouth as he ran his fingers over the lopsided wings. He dusted the fireplace mantle with his sleeve, placed the robin exactly in the center so he could look at it from his chair. The woodcarver did not eat supper that day. Instead, he began to sketch the final figures, Mary and Jesus. He drew Mary, then wadded the sketch into a ball and tossed it on the floor. He drew the baby, wadded the sketch into a ball, and tossed it with the first. He sketched again. Once more, he crumpled the paper. Soon, there was a small mountain of crumpled paper at his feet. He picked up a block of wood and tried to carve, but his knife would not do what he wanted it to do. He hurled the chunk of wood into the fireplace and sat staring into the flames. When he heard the church bells announcing the midnight service, he got up slowly. He opened the drawer beneath the cover, the drawer he had told the widow never to open. From it, he took the cloth and burner with lilies of the valley and daisies. He took out a rough wooden shawl woolen shawl, and a lace handkerchief. He took out a tiny white baby blanket and a little pair of blue socks. He placed each piece gently on the floor. From the bottom of the drawer, he lifted out a picture frame, beautifully carved, of deep brown chestnut wood. In the frame was a charcoal sketch of a woman sitting on a rocking chair holding a baby. The baby's arms were reaching up, touching the woman's face. 
One was looking down at the baby, smiling. Jonathan sat down on his rocking chair, held the picture against his chest. He rocked slowly, his eyes closed. Two tears trailed down his beard. When he finally took the picture to his workbench and began to carve, his fingers worked quickly and surely. He carved all through the night. The next day, there was a knock on the widow McDowell's door. When she opened it, there stood the woodcarver, his neck wrapped in a red scarf, holding a wooden box stuffed with straw. Mr. Toomey, said the widow, what a surprise. Merry Christmas. The figures are ready, he said as he stepped inside. From the box, Jonathan unpacked two curly head sheep. Happy sheep, because they were with Jesus. He unpacked a proud cow and an angel, a very important angel, with mighty wings stretching from his shoulders right down to the hem of his gown. He unpacked three wise men who were wearing the most beautiful robes edged with fur falling in the rich folds. Let's see, one, two, three, right there. He unpacked a serious carrying Joseph. He unpacked Mary wearing a rough woolen shawl, looking down, loving her precious baby son. Jesus was smiling and reaching up to touch his mother's face. And there's the box that everything was in. The next day, Jonathan went to the Christmas service with the widow McDowell and Thomas. And that day, in the churchyard, the village children saw Jonathan throw back his head, showing his eyes as clear blue as the August sky, and laugh. No one had ever called him Mr. Gloomy ever again. Look at that. The end.